Um, so hello everyone, uh, thank you for having us. Let's talk about language bias. Uh, but before that, um, my name is Neve Murphy. Um, I'm the Digital Collections Officer with the Irish Film Institute. Um, and in terms of language bias, I'm going to be talking about an English language default and showcase how and where this particular form of bias can manifest within relative environments um, where we all work. And this is Kieran O'Leary. He's the Digital Preservation Manager with the National Library of Ireland. And he's going to be discussing the perceived limitations and also provide practical examples for mitigation. So let's begin with the environment. Um, an investigation into cultural heritage and museums, whether that be within classification systems or collections, professional demographics or technology. And so with that, it is unsurprising that language bias sustains within this environment. And it is an issue that is often perpetuated without detection, but there are ample opportunities for mitigation. And so the first step is just to address the issue. Um, and so you can't really see it, but for the purpose of this talk, language bias refers to an English language default, which impacts billions of people across the globe and is also present across countless platforms. Um, so one may question the visibility of an English default. So let's look at a number of areas wherein the default resides and which directly relate to the preservation of AV material and the work that we all do on a day-to-day -day basis. So the areas I'll be looking at are code hosting platforms, programming languages, digital preservation software, and the cultural heritage community. So let's begin with code hosting platforms. And let's take, for example, GitHub. We all know and love, but the digital preservation community, as well as the AV preservation community, have a significant presence on this site, actively creating and collaborating in order to build better environments and tools with which we all work. One may ask, how does language default relate to this platform? And so this platform, which is presented as universal, diverse, and inclusive, and arguably necessary, is maintained in the English language. And what's more, as of 2016, GitHub no longer supports languages other than English. Before this, the platform supported a number of languages, which you can see on screen. Um, and there was even claims that more were to come. But instead, there was a monumental regression and English was made the default language. One might ask, how is this possible? Sorry, I moved on. How is this possible that such bias exists without high level intervention on a platform which asserts its position of diversity, diversity and inclusivity? The conclusion that I have come to is that language default resides so insidiously within this environment that it endures with little question. And another aspect which feeds into this issue is the false notion of neutrality that often surrounds technology, which leads us into our next slide, programming languages. As with other technologies are often perceived to be neutral, but this is a false notion. Most programming languages are in fact English-based. And according to the HOPL, over a third of all programming languages were developed in countries where English is the primary language. And these programming languages are English-based. This figure does not include programming languages that were developed in non-English-speaking countries or non-dominant English-speaking countries, 
but use English language to appeal to an international audience. Um, and a notable linguist, uh, her name is Gretchen McCulloch, she states that coding is for everyone as long as you speak English. So whether that be native English speaking or with access to the kind of education that produces fluent second language English in non-English dominant areas. She makes the point that while many programs and platforms offer translations or are available in different languages, the tools that make us the creators and not just the consumers are not. Which leads us to digital preservation software. The software that we use interacts with diacritics and syllabary outside of the Roman alphabet to varying extents. While researching for my master's thesis, I investigated the ways in which different software processed or failed to process languages outside of the English language. Some process the elements flawlessly, some with errors, and some will fail to process the material altogether. There is also another category of software which offers to clean or sometimes strip um, file names and folder names of diacritics, of accent marks, anglicizing them and altering their meaning, which thusly damages the integrity of the material. Um, and I understand that while this software has been developed to meet a proceed a perceived need of the community, the ideology that it is based upon is outdated. And so that leads us to the cultural heritage community. As of late, there are more discussions taking place online within the cultural heritage community about this very topic, with specific attention to naming conventions and the inclusion of diacritics it is increasingly apparent that the cultural heritage community are engaging with and attempting to address this issue. What's more, I suggest that the members of this community um, and um, adjacent communities are at the forefront in confronting this issue. And going forward as a community, it is imperative that we counter ideologies and systems which advance a default that perpetuates an unearned advantage to native English speakers um, in order to truly advocate for diversity and inclusion, to communicate and collaborate meaningfully, the English default must be addressed. And with that, I'm going to hand you to Kieran. Uh, thanks, Neve. Um, okay, so, my name is Kieran O'Leary. I'm the Digital Preservation Manager with the National Library of Ireland. Um, so following on from what Neve said, I'd like to look at some examples which align quite nicely with Elvia Arroyo Ramirez's amazing 2016 article, Invisible Defaults and Perceived Limitations, Processing the Juan Gelman Files. I encourage everybody to read that. We don't have time to go into it right now. We only have seven minutes. So um, you could say that Neve's section dealt with invisible defaults to a certain degree, and mine is maybe more about perceived limitations. So the Irish language contains many diacritics, often referred to as fadas. I imagine that everything I say here will resonate with anyone working with diacritics. And as in Elvia's article, we've either maybe seen or even adopted policies and practices about file names that may say something along the lines of A to Z, zero to nine underscores are best practice. And as someone who has written a lot of open source tools, I can say that these characters and file names and even embedded in files, they can cause tools to break and display issues can arise, but I'd argue that this is a perceived limitation. And in those instances, like I was very much the problem because I just, yeah. So uh, today I'd like to look at some examples of diacritics and file names, but also one other example of looking within the file themselves, how they can kind of pose an issue, but also how um, they can be fixed. So in this example, um, like we got some files recently in the NLI, uh, which had some um, Irish language uh, characters in them, which when processed on our forensic workstation cause issues with a number of tools. Um, Exif tool in particular uh, on Windows had issues with these characters and wouldn't even open the file. Um, although this is flagged and has been flagged for some time on the Exif tool FAQ and the forum as being much more of an issue with how Windows um, does not use UTF-8 as the default 
encoding for the Windows um, command line. Um, I think that uh, PowerShell doesn't deal too much better with the MITRE, to be honest. Okay, so, um, but this issue actually even extends to how Windows extracts files with its built-in unzipping tool. Depending on how the file names are encoded, you can kind of see it up the top there. Something's gone horribly wrong. Uh, that should just be like an uh, A accent and I accent where I don't know what that is. So, um, however, using something like 7-zip preserves the characters um, as they should be, and they display correctly in Windows Explorer at the very least. However, they end up being quite distorted when you drag and drop them into uh, the terminal. Now, earlier in my career, I often struggled to diagnose these issues, and even if I diagnosed them, I wasn't confident enough or didn't have the time and knowledge to actually figure out some sort of solution. However, this had a fairly straightforward solution. The donors used a Mac, and through some testing, it was clear that Macs behave differently than Windows when it came to diacritics. So, you can test this yourselves by creating a file name with a diacritic on a Mac. Then, um, you might have to zip it first, actually. Then, um, but if you copy and paste that file name into one of the many Unicode lookup tools that are out there, um, like in this instance, you can actually see that the character is composed of, well, it's two separate characters. The diacritic is separate, but it's supposed to display merged when everything works well. Um, this method of encoding uh, tends to get a little bit distorted on Windows, but it turns out that Windows natively creates file names in a completely different way. Um, so specifically, the character and the, the diacritic are combined, and this tends to be significantly more compatible with tools. And for example, uh, once I replaced the diacritic with one that was uh, created on Windows, everything was fine with exit tools, happy days. And you can see here that we are not seeing that kind of combined acute. It's all self-contained within the one character. So th that was the solution here. We ran it by the donor. We got their permission, which they were more than happy to provide. Uh, we ended up with the exact same outcome. It looks the same. We have something way more compatible that didn't do anything with our pre-ingest systems or anything. And as long as the tools support UTF-8, there shouldn't be any reason to like remove the diacritic or something. And another um, recent example uh, that my colleague Ginny Byrne, our systems librarian, raised with me um, involves some CSV spreadsheets. I know it's an AV conference, but look, we all deal with spreadsheets. So she generated some reports with a tool called Business Objects and noticed some significant issues. You can see here that Colm Tobin on the bottom and Breed Negrania are both represented incorrectly. And we can follow this pretty similar process as before to diagnose each issue separately because they're actually two completely separate issues, but it just looks like there's a lot of garble stuff happening here. So at the bottom, the column to beam one was interesting because if you just loaded it in a regular text editor, you can see that he looks fine. Right? Uh, you can see at um, the very bottom there, Toby in comma column. So um, and when you looked it up in the Unicode lookup tool, it was those combined uh, characters were used. So the issue here, um, there was nothing wrong with the characters themselves. Um, it was exif tool does not open CSV files with, as UTF-8 by default. It uses I think, like Windows 1252 or 1251 or something. So instead, if you like imported it um, as, like data as text or something like that and specify UTF-8 all as well, or even better, use LibreOffice Calc because it's way better at displaying CSV overall, lets you choose and preview your encoding. So in that issue, like you didn't need to change anything or do anything. It's like Excel was the problem. But with the top one, it was a whole different issue. If we look at it in the lookup um, tool, you can see that it is not a combined acute accent. It's just an acute accent. In the grand scheme of things, it's a backtick. And somewhere upstream, somewhere along the way, uh, these were sort of sanitized or something, I guess you could say. So I wasn't able to solve this issue myself. I don't know anything about business objects. Um, but uh, Jenny Byrne got in touch with Seamus Masherson in our IT department. He was able to figure out there was just a missing environment variable that was uh, needed for business objects to force UTF-8. Once that was done, everything was hunky-dory. Uh, like, it was really important for us because supporting the Irish language, even in these like, quite technical, nitty-gritty scenarios, they're really important to our institutions. So um, to wrap up, these are just two examples. I could probably talk for an hour about a whole bunch of other ones. Like, you could say like, um, you could just strip everything and turn them into a UUID or something and store the file name somewhere else, but not everyone is going to have the time or the infrastructure to add those kinds of things and then automate the reconstruction of them up for access. But anyway, I'm hoping that like, it shows there's a similar method of troubleshooting issues, potentially fixing them. And um, you know, all that stuff, it kind of takes a bit of like, 
familiarity with the tools and troubleshooting them. It takes time and experience, and resources of institutions need to be kind of applied to this stuff as well to give you the time to figure it out. Uh, before I read Elvia Arroyo Ramirez's piece, I hadn't fully questioned the whole A to Z, zero to nine, underscore thing. Um, but I'm glad that, uh, anyway, to go straight to the final sentence, um, I think it's just important for us to share these kinds of things, share the solutions for the people who don't have the time and effort, or they don't have the time to look into this stuff, so we can make a serious dent in the perceived limitations. Cheers, thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.